Dawn and I had to miss last Sunday uh, quite some, uh, quite unexpectedly. Uh, I don't know if you heard or not, we had the opportunity to uh, hit a a deer on our way out of Edmond on the way back from our, uh, just a weekend with our our kids and grandkids and uh, kind of boogered up the, the car pretty well. And so we are not able to make that trip back. I hate it when We miss, and I really, really wanted to be here for uh, Kendall and Amy, and they are sharing. I heard it was, uh, I heard it was remarkable, and so I just uh, wanted you to know that. Hey, um, some people have said, were you hurt? And we, we were, uh, by the grace of God, we were not hurt whatsoever. Uh, The only hurt, probably the deepest hurt occurred as at one point in time, I was, I was kind of at the front of the house talking to one of the boys. I came around the corner to, to observe the car one more time and the damage there, and, and kind of all six or seven of our grandparents kids were just kind of hovered around the corner of the car where uh, where the damage was and I stood there looking at them with uh, looking at it uh, with them and our four-year-old uh, <clears throat> granddaughter uh, Evie looked up at me with these huge doe-like eyes and said pops you killed a reindeer <laughs> that hurt that hurt. Well, we're in a series right now called Struggles, Overcoming the Lies That You Believe. And I know that a couple of weeks ago, uh, James did this incredible job of setting this up, of introducing us, telling us again that, that basically kind of this is a battlefield of the mind, all right? This is a battlefield of the mind. Last week, Kendall and Amy put some uh, feet on this force and talked about a specific area that many of us struggle, the area of racial equality and sometimes prejudices that we don't even realize that we have in us. And so there are sometimes lies in us, and they encouraged us to invite people to the table so we could hear some truths maybe that we have not talked about before or thought about. This morning, I'm just going to bottom line it real quick for you, all right? I'm going to let you know uh, uh, just exactly kind of where I'm going and what I want this to be about, okay? Here's the bottom line for us today, all right? Our thoughts, my thoughts become my beliefs. My beliefs become my behavior. My thoughts become my beliefs. My beliefs become my behavior. Here's what I see. What I see as a Christian in my own life, as a follower of Jesus, what I see in the lives of those I have grown up with, what I see in our lives sometimes as a church, I see that we have been taught, maybe in Sunday school, maybe by our parents, we have been taught a tremendous amount of truth, and we know that truth. But we continue to believe and act out of lies for whatever reason. Those lies have all kinds of voices in the past. They might be a parent. They might be someone who has influenced in our life. But they have told us something or done something. We take that thought. That thought eventually becomes a belief, actually. And then that belief begins to become fruit in our behavior. Someone has said that 85% of the thoughts that you and I have are negative thoughts, untrue thoughts. Or possibly with a measure of truth, but that end up uh, having some way they end up in behavior that is wrong or destructive. Think about this today. There's someone in the auditorium today. You, You are there and you have been told all your life, you are a failure. You will not ever get it right. And so you think that, and then you begin to believe that, and then you begin to behave in that way. There is someone here today who has gone through a divorce, and I've never seen a good divorce. And because of that divorce, you believe in your mind that you were rejected. And because of you believe you were rejected, you believe that you are worthless and that you will never be loved. You cannot be loved. You are not worthy of love. And you begin to think that and you begin to believe it. And then you begin to behave out of that thought. You, someone here today, believes that you just can't measure up. No matter what you do, you will not measure up. You just can't get it right. And out of that thought, you will begin to think 
and then you will begin to believe, I can't measure up, no matter what I do, and the hopelessness comes, and you will begin to behave out of that thought, I can't measure up, it is hopeless, or someone here today. And you really, truly believe when you wake up in the morning that you can't be happy unless you get every single thing done in the day that you think you've got to get done today. Right? You think that. And then you begin to believe that. And as you believe that, you begin to behave like that. And it messes up your day after day. It steals the joy. It makes you irritable and grumpy. And you don't like yourself and you feel worthless. There's someone here today that wakes up every morning. Maybe it's you. And you just want everything to be right. You want yourself more than anything to be perfect. And you begin to think, I should be perfect. You should begin to believe. You begin to believe that you should be perfect. And then you begin to act out and behave in a way, covering, having secrets, hoping that if you can't be perfect, at least people around you will believe that you are perfect. Some of you believe that maybe if you just get it right, God will accept you. And you know it goes against Scripture that God will accept us unconditionally. But in your mind, past the lessons you learned in Sunday school, in your mind there is that idea that maybe if I just do enough good, maybe if I get this one right, God will accept me. You think the thought, you begin to believe the thought, and the thought begins to come out in actions. My thoughts, folks, our thoughts become my beliefs. My beliefs become my behavior. And man, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination, does it? To see how those kind of thoughts that we just talked about can, can bear fruit in destructive, destructive, depressing behavior. 30 years ago, excuse me, 30 years, about 30 years after Jesus died, A man who had been a Jew, who was a Jew by the name of Paul. Maybe you have heard him before. This man had been a Jew, but he had come to Christ. And and because of his preaching, because of of the passion for what he did, he he ended up actually being put in jail by his fellow Jews, essentially. And he writes this letter from a prison cell, and he writes this brief letter to these people, this church in a city called Philippi. It's a brief letter. And basically the DT, the dominant theme of that letter is this. He writes, as he writes from a prison cell, the theme is live with joy. Live with joy. Thank him, he says, for all he has done. And then this, he says towards the end of the letter, which is only four chapters, only a few pages. He says this, one final thing. Oh, One, by the way, one final thing. Dawn and I did uh, camps for a lot of years, a long time. Now, I'm going to say 20 years, and it was at least that. And every summer, we would get kids, and they would bring fourth and fifth or sixth graders to, to, the, to the church. And moms, you know, would, would drop them off. But usually, we would take all the kids. We would load all their luggage. We would get them in a big circle with their moms or their dads or whatever. And we would have a word of prayer. And it was always interesting because after the prayer, something happened. After the prayer, the parents, one of the parents, always said one final thing to the kids. And sometimes it was something like, um, hey, remember, obey Miss Dawn. Uh, sometimes it was like, uh, hey, remember, remember to take your medication. Sometimes it was something humiliating like, hey, 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 as they jump on the van, remember to change your underwear. Kids always love that. One final thing. I'll never forget the time when we had a kid who had come and he was wearing, had this really good looking t-shirt on. I don't know what his mom's one final thing was, but I know what it should have been. Because when we got home after a five-day five week at camp, he still had that same favorite T-shirt on. I don't know if mom said, change your shirt. But he wasn't listening. And I still remember well the look of dread on her face as she saw, as she saw him get off the van with the same shirt five days later. Seriously, Paul's one final thing. 
Philippians 4, 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, he says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. So why is this, why is this Paul's one final thing before the kids get on the van? I mean, why is this important to him? Because Paul knows my thoughts become my beliefs and my beliefs become my behavior. See, we're in this series called The Struggle, Overcoming the Lies That Are in Our Minds. And Paul knows. Paul knows that this is a battle for the mind, as James says. Listen, we do ourselves and we do those like Paul a great disservice, folks. When we remove the fact that they were simply human beings who had the same struggles of mind, soul, and spirit that we did. I was just reading in the book of James the other day, and James ends up with this in the very, very last thing. He talks about Elijah and Elijah's prayer. When he prayed, it stopped raining. And he said this, Elijah was a human just like us. He made that point. He was no superhero. He was a human just like us. Sometimes we do, again, ourselves a great disservice, folks, when we take who we consider the heroes of the Bible, the great men and women of faith, and we remove the fact that they have struggled with these things in the same way that we do. What kind of struggle? What kind of struggle does a man have when he lays his head on his pillow or on the hard floor at night as he is laying in a prison Realizing that because of the conversion that he made, the faith that he, the faith that he called on, the conversion that happened in his life, that he has been completely cast off from his family and rejected by his Jewish family. Well, what kind of struggles does a man have as he was walking down a lonely road to, by himself to the next city, knowing that he might possibly meet death? Or even worse, just being maimed. What, what, what kind of mental struggles, what kind of lies can a man like Paul believe? As he is sitting in his prison cell, thinking about the fact that, that in this last city he was in, he met this young boy and this boy was an orphan. And when the boy told his story, the reason he was an orphan was because Paul, had had his father killed and his mother placed in prison. What kind of lies do those kind of things place in the mind of a man named Paul? See, let's not do the disservice to him or to ourselves. Paul had those same things. And the reason he says one final thing is because he knows this is vital. We must overcome the lies in our heads because lies... Those thoughts become beliefs, and the beliefs become behaviors. See, struggles were part of God's story, or excuse me, were part of Paul's God story. And folks, those things can become a destructive path. And man, I wish we had a little bit more time to talk about that. But the reason this is so vital is because when we have those things in our head, when we have those lies in our head, it begins to play havoc with our relationship with God. Because no matter what we have been told in Sunday school or even read in the Bible sometimes, we have those thoughts, and if we do not apply truth to them, it destroys our trust and relationship and ability to have faith in God. It destroys our ability to have trust in significant other relationships like marriage and good friendships and the city groups. It destroys our ability to have even a good relationship and be able to love ourselves and take care of ourselves. See, James talked about two weeks ago about that idea of this is a battlefield. But today, I, wanna, I just want to be as practical as I can with you all as practical as, as I can in how we train our mind. Paul says this, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. What he's saying, actually, the word is this. It is keep on thinking. It's kind of a continuous. It's, a, it's not just fix your thoughts once. It's keep on thinking. It's this process. And not only is it that, but when we say, when we read fix your thoughts, 
It's the idea of an intentionality. It's been said that men think in boxes. That we have our box, we have our work box, and we have our marriage box, and we have our parenting box, and we have our entertainment box. And then some have said that we have a box that is our nothing box. And that's when the woman looks at us and says, hey, honey, what are you thinking about? And we say, nothing. And, they, and then we have this conversation, well, you can't think about nothing. Oh, but I can Oh, but we can. Now, I don't know how long we can think about nothing. Because the truth is, and this is an important truth, the human mind will always eventually set itself on something. So what Paul says here is, here's some things he says to set your minds on. First, he says, set your mind on what is true. Or keep on setting your mind on what is true. What does that infer? That means that well, I'm going to set my mind on what's on true, but the lie is going to come back in. And so I've got to keep on setting myself, my mind on what is true. True versus what? False, right? And so this is an idea that Paul's saying, keep your mind on what you can really trust versus what is deceptive. Versus what is illusory. Men, and I guess even women, folks, listen. Pornography is possibly the most elusive, deceptive, promising something it can never deliver. And Paul is saying, think about the things that can actually deliver what they promise. The next word he uses is the word honorable. They keep thinking about the things that are honorable. This is a, this is a great picture there, kind of in the New Testament word. The word honorable is the man who moves through his life on a daily basis as if he is actually in the presence or the temple of God. He lives his life each moment, each day, as if he is actually in the temple of God. And so what happens when you're in the presence of God consistently? We, we lose our appetite. We see that. We see what the plastic is. We see what doesn't really last. We see what the flippant is. And our, our eyes have beheld the real thing, the authentic, the honorable. Paul says to keep on thinking about that which is right. And actually the word here is just. Right or just. Just. It's the idea of a person when we live our lives doing our duty to God. Now, sometimes with duty, gets kind of gets kind of a backslap a little bit, right? Like duty? I don't want to live out of duty. I don't know. There's, there's a part of love that is duty. When we're not feeling, but we do the right thing because it's the right thing. And this, this just or right means that we live our lives doing the duty to God that we need to and the duty to man. I had a man just a couple weeks ago talk to me who his wife is is sick and has been very sick for a long time and for quite some time he gave her 24 7 care and he said steve and he wasn't bragging at all matter of fact he, he felt badly about it he said I, I feel like i've just just done my duty at times and then a week later i read this and i thought what an honorable what an honorable just and right thing even when the feeling was gone, even when, it, when, even when it became, became, he became tired, he continued to do his duty to God and the person he loved. The next word is pure. Keep, keep thinking about what is pure. And, and this is the idea of, of this ceremony being, being ceremonially, ceremonially cleaned to come into God's presence and be used by him for his purposes. You know anybody? You know anybody who turns every conversation, every word into some kind of a sexual innuendo? You, you know someone who, who just takes every opportunity when we're talking about a person to somehow turn it and end up being critical or backbiting? That's the opposite of this. This is that I am preparing my life. 
I'm cleansing myself, keeping myself clean so that I can actually come into his presence and be used by him. The next word is lovely. They love, these people love what they see. And this is interesting. They draw out the kindness in people. They draw out the goodness. They see it. And as they see it in people, they draw it out of those people. Lovely. Who do you know? Who do you know that when you think about someone who draws out the best in you, who do you think about? That's lovely. The last one is admirable. Things that are fit for God to hear. Wow. Things that are fit for God to hear. As a person like myself who speaks way too much. This is a tough one for me. Because the more I speak, the more apt I am to begin talking about things and saying things that are not apt or good for God to hear. They are not admirable type things. You know what I, you know what I love about these folks? You know what I love about this? I love that, that when Paul says one final thing and he shares these words, it's not forbidding language, is it? It's not, it's not don't think about these things. It thinks, here's the thing, the pure, the admirable, the excellent, the good. Think about these things. It's not forbidden language. It's not try not to do these things. It's not running away from something, but it's running to something. Because God knows, folks, God knows that when something bad has been removed from our life, it must be replaced by something else. Or what happens? The bad comes rolling back in, Right? And years ago, when I went to Celebrate Recovery, my mentor taught me that very, very strong. He said, Steve, if there is a bad habit and addiction in our lives, in, in my life, and you begin to deal with it, and you get rid of that behavior without getting the root of it, he said, that behavior or another behavior that might possibly be more socially acceptable will roll right in to take its place because you've never dealt with the root problem. And Paul knows Paul knows, folks, that you and I, listen to this, we can be saved by truth. We can be saved by truth, but we can continue to live our lives daily in relationship with ourselves and others and God by lies if we don't take the truth and apply it to that. So I want to give you a plan. I want to give you, oh, some of you like, you got the pencil out, you got the, okay, yeah, now, now he's going to give us a plan. I want to give you a plan. But I know when I say a plan, I know that some of you are going, okay, all right, man, I'm going to double down on this one. I'm going to, I'm going to get this. I've been struggling with this, but I'm going to get this thing right. I'm going to try harder. And so I thought about leaving this piece off to the end, but I thought, no, 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 no. I got I to put this at the front end. Here's what I want you to know. The Holy Spirit must be the power for this plan. The Holy Spirit must be the power for this plan. If you attempt to do this by yourself, you will fail. And you'll become more hopeless. Here's the plan. Let me back up just a second. When you see someone in war and they throw up the white flag of surrender, they are not going to go to the table and present their case as to, well, we're going to surrender, but here's how we'd like it. We'd like you to do this for us, and we'd like you to do this for us, and we'll do this. No, when you throw up the white flag of surrender, it means I got nothing. I, I know that you are in control that you're going to be the gain the victory over me. And so I'm just surrendering. I'm, I'm waving the white flag. I got nothing left. I can't do this on my own. We say to God. And folks, I'm going to tell you, God is waiting for you and I to throw up in these areas that have conquered us where we have consistently believed lies and they have become, be, have become beliefs and they are manifesting themselves in behavior. He is waiting for us to surrender, to quit trying, to lay down our will and to wave the white flag. Here's the first thing. Ready for this? First one is this, find it. Find it. Find the lie, all right? Find the lie. Here it goes. It goes like this. Thought, believe, Behavior. 
And so often as Christians, what we find is this, is that we attack what? We attack the behavior, right? Because we're taught in Sunday school that that behavior is wrong, and it is. But what we don't realize is there's this root underneath it. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do in in this idea of finding it is to put the car in reverse. And as opposed to attacking the behavior, let's look, go backwards through it, through behavior, belief, and the think, the thought, okay, idea. Where did that come from? Let me give you an idea. A number of years ago. I realized I was struggling with food, with the thought of food all the time. I thought about food constantly. And when I was, when I was getting ready for one meal, I mean, I was, when I was gorging one meal, I was already in the middle of that meal. I was already thinking about the next meal. And then when I got done with that meal, I was thinking about what I was going to have for a snack. And then I was thinking about supper. I mean, I was thinking about it all the time. And when I finally realized, and I tried to attack the behavior, God, I'm not, today I'm going to eat right. Today, I'm going to eat my right portions. And I had all those conversations with myself over years. Been there before? Anybody struggle with that? Come on. Come on. It's not illegal. It's a sin, but it's not illegal. All right? And here's what I realized. I realized that my very first thought in the morning, when my eyes opened, you know what it's about? Food. And I thought, how do I beat that? I can't beat my first thought. I can't get ahead of my first thought. I mean, my eyes open up and I'm thinking, what am I having for breakfast? What am I having for lunch? How much is there going to, I mean, it was all over the place. And so while my fight began with the root of the problem, which was that food made me happy. And if I had a problem, I ate food. If I didn't have a problem, if I was angry, if I was having conflict sometimes at home, I ate food. I mean, that's what I did. And so I finally realized I went to the Holy Spirit and I said, Holy Spirit, I can't beat my first thought. And so when I wake up in the morning, you are going to have to immediately speak to me and say, okay, it's not about food. I am what you need. I am what you need. And so you, so that, that began a start. I could, I could extrapolate on that more, but that's what it looks like to find it, to begin to find it. Number two, number two is write it. Write it. See, most, most lies we believe contain, folks, just enough truth for us to not recognize the lie. It's 97% lie, but there's 3% truth, and so that keeps us holding on to it and rationalizing the behavior. Folks, and here's the deal. As long as that thought is only a thought, as long as it is in your mind, it is a cloudy thought and a cloudy lie. And when Paul says to take captive every thought, listen, you cannot take captive a cloud. You got that? You can't capture a cloud. And as long as it is, that lie is only in your head. I'm not good enough. I have to do everything right. I'm a screw up. As long as that is there, my marriage is hopeless. I'm an awful parent. As long as that thought is there, folks, you cannot capture it. You cannot fight it. You cannot get over it until you write it down. And when you write it down, incredible things begin to happen. When you write it down, it has, it goes from cloudy to clear. And you begin to see the ridiculousness of it. And then you can begin to look at the root of where that actually came. As long as it's in your mind, that will not happen. We have to tell ourselves the truth. I was reading this book called Telling Yourself the Truth by William Backus. Okay, excellent book. You might, if you're looking for more resources, really, really good. And on page 35, whoever owned this book, and and I guess I I didn't realize it was used. (laughs) Their name wasn't in it. But all of a sudden, I got to page 35, and somebody had written in it. And you know what they wrote? They wrote a half page of all the lies they believe about themselves. I have no friends. I am fat. My hair is awful. I'm lonely. I can't get anything done. This is, this is not, this is someone who owned this book. It has to be right. I'm over my head. I'm an awful mother. Those are powerful thoughts. Well, whoever it was took the time to write it down. And I believe things begin to happen when they did. What is it for you? I'm a terrible parent. Healthy food doesn't taste good. There's a lie for us. 
my marriage is hopeless. Find it, write it. Folks, if you will not take the time to write it, the problem will continue, the lie will continue to drive your behavior. Number three, fight it. So what we do, we write down the lie and literally right on the other side of the page, you write down the truth of it, okay? You write down the truth. You take the truth and you look at the lie, you write it down. Now you write the truth next to it. Folks, this has to be done. If you will not do it, again, you will continue to struggle with that. And when you look at the lie and when you look at the truth, things will begin to happen dramatically. Your life will begin to change dramatically when you take specific truth to specific lies. I had a cup of coffee with my friend Tommy Craig this week. And I said, Tommy, you used to be all over out there as far as like searching for truth. What happened? He said, Steve, the year that I read the Bible from front to back and began to study the word, all that stuff just kind of lost its shine. And I found myself just drawn to truth and I quit believing lies. Folks, Randy's talking about joining city groups. And I just want to tell you this. I'm going to be really strict with you. Some of you will not sign up for a city group because you are believing a lie. Because someone has taught you that your faith is just a private thing. Because dad said one time or 20 times, dad said, hey, we don't go airing our laundry to everybody. We just keep that stuff to ourselves. Because you are believing a lie that if you share from your heart and what's really going on in your life, someone will reject you and not love you. Because you believe in your life or you believe in your heart right now that, that no one wants you in their city group. And those lies will keep you from the life that God has for you of community and caring for one another, give and take and sharing and the building up and the relationship with others that it takes for us to get past these lies into living by truth. We find it, we write it, we fight it. Paul says, interesting enough, Philippians 4, 9, he says, keep putting into practice all you learned and receive from me everything you heard from me and saw me doing. I had this interesting thing a mom gave me this the other day. It's from her 10-year-old son who had messed up, done something wrong. And they said, we want you to write, sit down and write down why you believe you are doing wrong. Here's one of the things he wrote. I'm listening to the wrong people. Listening. L-I-S-S-E-N-I-N-G. That's okay. He misspelled the word, but he got it right. I'm listening to the wrong people. Who are you listening to? We're asking you to move into relationships with people through city groups of people who will speak truth to you and challenge you and encourage you and build you up. Folks, it's going to take people for us to get over and past the lies. We cannot do it by ourselves. Act on it. Act on it. That some people say this is like, feels like fake it till you make it. I don't like that phrase, fake it till you make it. Because what, for a lot of us, it feels very inauthentic. I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'm going to do something that's inauthentic. No, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is this. We're talking about recognizing that you are behaving out of a lie. And now I'm going to begin behaving out of the truth. I am simply going to do the right thing. The feelings may, may, may make you feel like you're faking it. But you are doing it in faith according to the truth. You're not faking it till you make it. You are behaving from truth and behaving by faith before you feel it. Act on it. It is important. I realize how important it is in my marriage, in my friendships, in my ministry for me to do the right thing even when I do not feel like it. Can you relate to that? Yeah. Last one's this. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. If you have spent a decade or two or three decades of living out in behavior according to a lie that is in your mind, all right, that is a deeply grooved problem. You, there's a rut there. And so you're not just going to write this thing down and do these things I ask, and it's all, all of a sudden it's just like, like a life of victory. You're probably going to be 
you're probably going to be like 1 and 11 for a season. And then you're going to be 2 and 10. And then you're going to be 3 and 9. You're going to, and, and when you get those victories, what do we do? Folks, what do we do when we get a loss? God, I'm so terrible. I'm worthless. I'm a failure. I can't get this thing right. I must not love Jesus. I know Jesus doesn't love me. I mean, we just tear ourselves up, right? And man, folks, listen, when we get a win, when you get the first time you get a win over this thing and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you act out of the right thing or the first time you actually write down that lie and there's a victory there, folks, listen, it is time to celebrate, folks. It is time to celebrate. You have got to, I know some of you guys are like, oh, I don't celebrate much, Steve. Listen, break out of it. Come on, Holy Spirit, work through me. It is time to woot, okay? I mean, if you got to win, you got to woot, all right? You got that? Let's just do this all together. Okay, clench the fist. I know this is hard for some of you. Clench the fist. Put it right here, okay? Give me a woot, 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 woot. That's not too bad. Give me three woots. Woot, woot, woot. So when you get a victory, you got to woot it up, okay? A win deserves a woot. If you're going to win, you got to woot. You got to jump up and down. You got to plant a tree. You got to do something. I'm telling you, listen, I know I, I'm, I don't mean to be crazy on this. Yeah, I do mean to be crazy on this. Because if you don't woot, you will roll back into defeated lives. You will begin rolling back into those lies. The woot is what takes you to the next step and gives you hope that you can get another win. Woot it up. Woot it up. Celebrate it. Folks in Celebrate Recovery, man, they celebrate wins because they know they got to do that to get through the next day. Celebrate it. If I could take the word celebrate, excuse me, take the word recovery out of celebrate recovery, I would in a moment. Because you don't even realize this, and it's not intentional. But when we begin to talk about celebrate recovery, most of you hear the word recovery and you think addiction and you think gambling, drugs, alcohol, and you think, I don't have that problem. So celebrate recovery is not for me. Man, I wish I could take the recovery out of celebrate recovery. Call it celebrate something else. You got to celebrate right. Folks, I'm, I'm, you've heard me say this. It changed my life. I didn't have a gambling problem. I didn't have a drug problem. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a, 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 an alcohol problem. I mean, all that stuff. But man, I had, I had lies I was believing in my life had for years. That was, keeping, that was keeping my relationship with Dawn. So mediocre sometimes because I couldn't love her the way she needed to be loved. Keeping my ministry... The, 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 the roof of my ministry down. It was keeping my relationship with God and myself and other people because I was living out lies. And I would invite you to, to, to whatever you have to do to get past the fact of what you think happens on Thursday night. All it is is this. It's people who, by the grace of God, are allowing God to come in and root out the areas of their life where they are living by, where they have believed lies and they are living by lies. And that's all of us. Here's three lies. Some of us believe. Sometimes it's because we have never, ever received Christ in our life. And sometimes it's because we have received him, but we just, we still believe a lie. Here's a lie we believe. God doesn't love me. written. Look at it. Here's the truth. God showed or demonstrated his love for us by this, that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the truth. Here's another lie that we believe. This is who I am. I cannot change, Steve. I'm, I'm sorry. This is just, 
I've been this way too long. I've heard so many people say that recently. This is just who I am. I can't change. Here's the truth. Let God transform you. You're probably right. You can't change. God can change you. Paul knew that transformation was something that had to be done by the word through the spirit. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Here's another lie. I'm too far gone. I've done too much wrong. Is that something you believe in your mind right now? Is that something you believe in your mind right now? I've done too much wrong. I'm too far gone. God's grace can't extend to me. Here's what Paul says. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as the prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. And then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Folks, I don't know what lie you're believing, but I know who has the truth. And I know it's there for us if we will do and allow the Holy Spirit to do in us. Don't keep believing those lies. God loves you. He sent his son to demonstrate that love for you by taking your sin upon himself if you only confess belief in that.